Well, let's take our Bibles now and turn to the book of Psalms, number 115. The book of Psalms, number 115. And we're going to read the entire psalm. Psalm 115 and verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O Aaron, trust in the house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Let's bow together in prayer. Our God, as we come before you this morning, we acknowledge we are not here to get glory to ourselves, but to give glory to your holy name. For you alone are God. You have made the heavens and the earth, and all of the gods of the nations are truly nothing. We thank you that you have made yourself known to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that because of his great redemption, we can come and stand before your throne today and know that we are accepted. Heavenly Father, receive from our hands the gifts that we bring to you today, lips that would gladly confess your name and sing your praises. Would you please pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and in our weakness help us to bring to you the worship that you deserve. Please come and minister to us through your word and spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's take our blue hymn books and turn to number 53 and lift our voices to praise our great God. These words coming from Psalm 146, Praise ye the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. Hymn number 53.
Now let's take our copies of God's Word again and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We learned in chapter 1 of the glorious revelation of Jesus Christ that John the Apostle had when he was in exile and that this book was essentially a letter to seven churches and he's been addressing them individually uh, beginning in chapter 2 and now in chapter 3 the last three of the seven churches and as with the previous letters the identification at the beginning of each letter goes back to that vision. So the churches are to remember who the resurrected Christ is that appeared to John. The reminder of, I know, Christ knows all about what's going on in his churches. And the encouragements and the rebukes and the comfort and the challenge to listen carefully because through these letters, the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches. And of course, it's our challenge, looking back 2,000 years, to consider what is Christ saying to us? What can we learn from these various examinations of the churches? Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, the a letter to Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now here's a devastating message from Christ to this church. That opening evaluation in verse at the end of verse 1, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And so people looking in from the outside on that church would say, wow, there's a lot going on. There seems to be a lot of life, a lot happening there. And yet Christ said in reality that they were dead. And so we need to be careful about outward reputations we need to make sure that uh, the heart is what is essential before Christ. This was a mixed congregation. Uh, obviously, there were a few people there in Sardis still being faithful to Jesus Christ. May the Lord help us to be like them. Verse 7, the church in Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Before, behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth." I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. 
The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I've always considered this church in Philadelphia to be a small church because Christ says to them, I know that you have but little power. That seems to indicate a small group of people who looking at themselves and their resources said, we can't do much for Christ. And yet the Lord said to them, I can use you, I can make you very useful. In fact, he says, I have put before you an open door that no one can shut. We often use that terminology sort of in in Christian lingo about uh, God has opened the door for us. In other words, there's opportunities. And Christ can use even a little group with little strength to do great things for Him as we look to Him. And then finally, beginning in verse 14, the church in Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say... I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you you may see." Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne." He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When you read through this letter from Christ to the church in Laodicea, you wonder whether we and modern Christians in general really know the Lord Jesus. Here was our Savior coming to a church and basically saying to them, You make me sick, you make me want to vomit. Wow! Would we have ever imagined our Savior saying such words to His professing people? But there's incredible grace here. For not only does He accurately describe them, but He invites them to repent, and He invites them to the most incredible fellowship. He says, I'm standing at the door of the church and I'm knocking. If anyone will open the door, I'll come in and I'll sit down and have communion with you. Christ doesn't point out all of our sins and our failures and just immediately reject us. He always gives opportunity to repent and gives the greatest encouragement that because He loves us, that is why He rebukes us and disciplines us. Well, may we not just look on these as church letters to churches 2,000 years ago, but hear the voice of Christ through His Word. What would He say to us? What do we have to repent of? Where have our hearts grown cold and we've wandered away from the Savior? This morning in prayer, we want to continue to remember our friends in the Far East, I've been getting emails every day with updates from the two countries where they're ministering in schools and orphanages and the needs just seem to be getting worse and uh, more and more desperate. The situation incredibly bad. 
And so we want to lift them up in prayer and pray that God would protect His people in the midst of these great trials and even cause the ministries there to flourish. And then, of course, we want to pray for our dear sister Rosalie as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the straightforward speech of our Savior to His churches. Obviously, He doesn't beat around the bush. We ask our Father that You would help us to listen for our sake. We're not examining churches 2,000 years ago. We're not even examining churches in our day, other churches. Lord, You want us to look at ourselves. We thank You that the Lord Jesus calls us to repentance. We thank You that He offers words of encouragement and comfort and holds out to us the promise of blessed things. We want to know this fellowship with our Lord Jesus. We want to know Him here in the midst of His people helping us as we seek to live together as Your church. Father, we do remember our friends in the Far East and the great difficulties that those ministries are experiencing. We ask our God that You would help Your people, that You would protect these works. Father, You know the goal of these ministries to bring the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to needy young people and children and ultimately families and even see uh, Christians raised up in those lands who will be faithful witnesses for Jesus Christ. Father, You know all of the needs, the financial needs, the need for food, the need for safety and protection. We ask that You would provide all of these and so much more. Father, keep them from fear. Help them to trust in You. Help the workers to be wonderful examples of Christians to these young people and children. And Father, we pray that You would cause Your churches in these lands to flourish. Though men would seek to stamp out the Gospel, Lord, we know that It is not man who controls the outcome of things, but you are in charge, and we commit this to you. We also remember our sister Rosalie in the hospital. Will you please minister to her today? We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help the doctors as they perform various tests and seek to understand what is wrong. Will you grant them the wisdom, help them to be able to identify what is wrong and know what to do. We pray, Father, that she would be able to come home in a couple of days and begin to get stronger again and to eat again. And, Father, that we would see her and Scott here with us in the future, rejoicing at your goodness. Father, continue to help us. We look to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take our blue hymn books one more time and turn to 142 as we sing about our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that uh, as the heading from Proverbs 18 goes, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and our Lord Jesus is the greatest friend that anyone could ever have. 142.
Well, please take your copies of the Word of God again and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. In our study, we're in chapter 3, and the paragraph that begins with verse 12. We'll read this paragraph again this morning. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Well, let's again seek God's face in prayer. Our Father, we would never have planned these circumstances that we find ourselves in. But we know our God in some strange and mysterious way. They're part of your eternal plan. And so that even we should be here this morning as a small group to hear your word. Lord, we know that you have planned this. You've ordained us to be here. You've given us this passage of your word to study. And how we pray, our God, that You would come to us and that You would accomplish in our lives what You've planned from eternity to make us like the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, we cannot do for ourselves what we need. We cannot properly examine ourselves or lift ourselves up to be like the Lord Jesus. We need your work through your word and your spirit in our lives. So shower us this morning with your grace and what you have planned accomplish today and bring glory and honor to your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Life in the Church of Christ requires that we walk a tightrope balancing two seemingly opposite realities. On the one hand, we must maintain the ideals of the New Testament church that the Bible speaks so much about. What are these ideals? Well, the fact that the church is a temple of God in which He manifests His glory. So we think of the universe and we know how God manifests His glory out there. The Bible tells us that in the church there is an even greater manifestation of the glory of God. We're also reminded in the New Testament that the church is the bride of Christ purchased by His precious blood. So here is something that is really special to God, something that is very precious to Him. And one day it's going to be revealed in all of its glory. The Bible also tells us that the church is God's special treasure. And something in which He delights, He has loved the church with an everlasting love. That love will go on through the days of eternity. Well, all of those pictures and many more give us a glorious presentation of the church. It presents to us the great ideals that God has intended for His church. On the other hand, the other side of the coin is the realism about the church 
which the New Testament is also very honest about. What's that realism? Well, it's simply this, that we are a group of sinners, though rescued by the grace of God from the dominating power of sin, that sin is still very present in our lives as individuals and as a body. And so as a result, and the New Testament makes this very plain, church life is often very messy. There are breakouts of sin. Relationships sometimes fall apart. Error can creep in and the truth of God be distorted. Great divisions can surface and mar the testimony of Christ's church. You go through letter after letter in the New Testament and you see this reality. Even in these letters we've been reading here from Christ to the seven churches in the book of Revelation speak of this messiness that is often part of church life. And so God calls on us to walk this tightrope and to balance these two great realities. If we don't, it will eventually lead to spiritual disaster. For one thing, we'll fail to have that glorious view of the church that God wants us to have. And without this exalted view of the church, it will lose its prominence in our thinking and affections. We'll treat it just like anything else. It will become no more special than a trip to the grocery store. And we may end up seeing it as unnecessary in our lives. But if we don't also keep the realism in view, it will lead us to great disappointment and sometimes even despair. Rather than looking to God for a glorious work among His people, we'll lose hope for seeing anything wonderful happen in the life of the church. It might even cause us to give up praying. So, this tightrope with these two seemingly opposite realities is part of the fabric of Colossians chapter 3. The ideal that Paul presents to us is that the church is God's new humanity. It's this gathering of people that God is creating to display His image in the world. That original creation, that original image of God created in Adam and Eve, that's been marred and wrecked and ruined. But now in the church, God is making something new, created after His own image. We are to show God to the world. What an incredible reality Paul puts in this chapter. Yet there is also incredible realism. Because this new humanity that Paul speaks of here in Colossians 3 is still struggling with things like sexual immorality and covetousness and fractured relationships. Well, that surely gives us a heightened sense of the importance of these exhortations that Paul gives to us in this chapter. We must put sin to death. We must strip off those old clothes of the old man and put on the new clothes which are meant to identify us as the people of God, the new humanity that God is creating. And in this work of sanctification, which we must pursue as those who have been raised up in Christ, that's how Paul begins the chapter, we are called upon to narrow the gap between these realities and become what God has called us to be. This morning we're going to focus our attention on verses 12 and 13. And I want us to begin, first of all, by looking at the clothes of the new humanity. The clothes of the new humanity. Now, I don't know if you like to go clothes shopping. Some people find that delightful. Other people hate it. 
But this shopping expedition that Paul wants to take us on should by, be loved by every Christian. For God has set before us here in Colossians 3 on these racks of Christian experience some of the most beautiful and practical spiritual garments that you could ever see. In fact, in many ways, this is a parallel to what might be called Paul's most beautiful chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. Often you have 1 Corinthians 13 uh, read at wedding ceremonies because it's a beautiful statement of what love is. Well, here is something very similar to that as the Apostle sets before us the beauties of the new humanity using this illustration of clothing, things that we need to put on. When these clothes are worn by God's people, according to God's direction, they make for a beautiful church life. They help to create an atmosphere where saints can grow in holiness to reflect more and more of the image of God. And they testify to the world that the church is a place where God really is creating a new humanity, something that brings glory to His name. Now, I want us to examine these pieces of clothing individually. We'll look at them piece by piece. Paul lists seven here in verses 12 and 13. First of all, he speaks of putting on compassionate hearts. The old King James translates bowels of mercy. Literally, Paul's words are intestines of compassion. You see, the ancients, the people living in the first century, wouldn't have understood our Valentine's Day rituals with all of the heart-shaped symbols. That would have meant nothing to them. To them, the seat of the emotions were the intestines. That's where you felt things deeply. And so in the first century, if you were writing a Valentine's Day card, you would say to someone, I love you with all my intestines. Now that sounds strange to us, but that's why Paul uses this kind of language. And of course it's not totally unknown to us. How often do we speak of having butterflies in our stomachs? We understand sort of that connection between our emotions and the visceral part of our body piece of clothing of the new humanity combines deeply felt emotions with compassion or sympathy. It bears the sense of feeling deeply for the needs of others. In his study on this chapter, Kent Hughes says this, The ancient world, apart from biblical revelation, was merciless. The maimed and sickly and aged were discarded. The mentally ill were subjected to inhumanities. But Christianity brought compassion, and it still does. Paul is reminding us here, as he calls us to put on compassionate hearts, that Christians cannot be emotionless, insensitive people. Beginning within the church, we must exercise hearts that go out in sympathy to our brothers and sisters whenever they are in need. Whether that need is physical or economic or spiritual, we must be ready to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And so, on any given Lord's Day as we gather together, And perhaps it's announced that this person over here has a great need. Maybe they've just had a cancer diagnosis or death in the family or they've lost their job, whatever it happens to be. Well, we can't sit over here and just, oh, nice details, nice facts and, you know, too bad. No, compassionate hearts, our hearts immediately are to go out to that person. We're to feel for them. We're to have a sympathy with them in their time of need. Compassionate hearts. 
The second piece of clothing is kindness. Here's the description of a heart attitude that desires to do good to other people. In other words, it's not just a matter of having deep feelings for someone else in the congregation, but this clothing of the new humanity, this kindness, desires to follow up and help. And so here it's been announced that this brother or this sister has something going on in their lives. And it's not just a matter of our emotions kicking into gear and feeling sympathy for them. Kindness would dictate to us, oh, how can I help them? What can I do to alleviate that suffering or to encourage them? If a sister is going in for surgery, you might go and inquire, how can I assist? What can I do? How, how can I help you get through this difficulty? If you see a fellow a believer struggling with some emotional issue, perhaps the unbelief of a grown child, you seek to draw alongside and give encouragement. Kindness, as we put it on as believers, teaches us to say, how can I help? What can I do to minister to you? The third piece of clothing is humility. Or we could translate it lowliness of mind. The Gentile world hated this concept. Even though it's a word in Greek, the Greeks would never use this as a word to describe themselves. They thought that humility was something despicable, contemptible. And yet, we find in the Bible that humility is a choice virtue, an example of the grace of God working in a person's life. One commentator translated Paul's word here, a deep sense of one's littleness. A deep sense of one's littleness. Again, Kent Hughes in uh, writing on the chapter says, the person who wears the garment of humility knows who God is, what man is, and who he or she is. And then he follows up with this statement, those who walk with awareness through a wheat field will notice that it is the drooping ears that are heavy with grain, commending humility. Well, I think that statement is very helpful. The one who is truly humble knows who God is. He has an exalted sense of God's greatness and glory. He knows what man is, just a creature of the dust. Somebody that God scraped up some dust and put together and breathed life. What's that creature compared to God? And knows who he or she is. Yes, a creature made by God, but a sinner. And someone who because of his own personal actions deserves God's judgment in hell. We're not people who should be lifting ourselves up. We're people who should have a deep sense of our own littleness. And this piece of clothing that we're to be putting on as God's new humanity is to be exercised particularly as we view others within the church. Throughout the New Testament, again and again, humility is urged upon God's people. Listen to this well-known statement from Paul in urging the Philippians to be humble people. Philippians 2.3 Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. You're not in a contest with one another. You're not trying to see who's better than your fellow Christian. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And so, as we have opportunity to spend time together, we're not looking down at people, we're looking up at people. We're considering our brothers and sisters more important than ourselves. The clothing of humility. The fourth garment is meekness. Here's another characteristic that the world just doesn't understand. 
They usually equate meekness with weakness. But it's far from that. And we know that because of the many examples given to us in the Word of God. For instance, Moses. In Numbers chapter 12, God tells us that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Now, there's no way that you would ever look at Moses and say he was a weak man. Moses was a powerful, strong leader. He was a leader who often uh, exhibited strong emotions. Remember him coming down from Mount Sinai and discovering the golden calf. And he takes those tablets of the Ten Commandments and he smashes them on the ground. He was a strong leader. Meekness is essentially strength under control. Strength under, con- under control. And we find that often in the life of Moses. We find it in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. People who have great gifts from the Lord and yet those things are under control. Often meekness is described as being the opposite of harshness or rudeness. It's all about how we relate to people, how we deal with people. We might have authority over people. How, how do we deal with them? Are we meek? Are we, are we domineering? Are we overbearing? Or are we very kind and gentle? The fifth piece of clothing that Paul urges us to put on, patience. Or it could be translated long-suffering or forbearance. It's a quiet spirit in the face of unfavorable circumstances. One lexicon defines it this way, to remain seated in one's heart, to keep one's heart from jumping, to have a waiting heart. In other words, somebody does something to you that's not right. And naturally your heart wants to jump. And yet patience would teach us to remain seated in our heart. Not to react quickly. It's the self-restraint that does not hastily retaliate a wrong. Slow to avenge. Or long-temperedness. How often does the Bible tell us that our God is slow to anger? Patience, long-suffering. The sixth piece of clothing is similar, bearing with one another. This has the idea of enduring things, of exercising self-restraint and tolerance. So someone is attacking you in the church. They're saying things against you. How do you respond? Well, by exercising self-restraint. It often means keeping our mouth shut in difficult circumstances. Or responding to cursing with blessing. Enduring the attack with a gracious attitude. It's amazing that Paul says as Christians... We have to learn to endure one another. We have to learn to endure one another. Sometimes as fellow Christians, we're going to get on each other's nerves so much that the proper response is, I've got to endure this brother. I've got to endure this sister. Hopefully, that being along with a piece of clothing of humility, so you're not looking down on this person, but in this given circumstance, they're getting on your nerves, and you have to learn to endure. The final, the seventh piece of clothing is forgiving one another. Now the word that Paul uses here for forgiveness It's not the normal word used for forgiveness in the New Testament. It's actually a deeper, richer word meaning to freely forgive or to completely cancel a debt. It's speaking of having a willing spirit, of being ready to forgive without attaching any strings. It's used to speak of wiping out a record, canceling a debt. 
So where there has been a wrong, uh, uh, an offense committed against you, and the offender has recognized their sin and they come in repentance, there must be a willingness to forgive. Grudges cannot mark relationships in the church of Christ. These must be put behind us. So here are these seven articles of clothing that are meant to mark the new humanity. They're virtues that we're called to be putting on by the grace of God. These are the characteristics that will enable us to recognize one another as God's new creation. Now having looked at this clothes, the clothes of the new humanity, I want us secondly to consider some practical applications for the new humanity. We've been told what the clothing is, Hopefully we have at least a basic understanding of each of these articles of clothing. Now some practical applications for the new humanity. This question, how do you put on these clothes? How do you put on these clothes? Well, we all know how to put on clothes. We're all here clothed this morning and probably we all dressed ourselves. But when Paul tells us how to put clothes on spiritually, how does that work? How, how do we do it? Well, here are some truths drawn from the Word of God that I trust will help us as we think through these issues. We need to get to work putting on these clothes before you actually need them. We need to get to work putting on these clothes before you actually need them. Now, the realism of the New Testament helps us to understand that the life of the Christian church is going to be marked by sinful troubles. So, we know that. We, we've got that reality in our minds. We've experienced that. But thankfully, God gives us many seasons in the life of His church of peace and love and unity. And the lesson is, don't simply sit back during those times of peace and love and unity and ignore this responsibility of putting on the clothing. That's the time that God has given to us to be working at these things, to be putting on these articles of clothing. In other words, don't wait for the crisis and then all of a sudden think, oh, what pieces of clothing am I to be wearing in the midst of this crisis? Use the time now to be putting on these articles of the new humanity so that you will be ready when the challenges come, so that you'll be wearing those articles of clothing. You'll know how to respond when the challenges come. I've been reading uh, a history of Princeton Seminary. It was something recommended to me decades ago, and I'm just now getting to it. It's actually a pretty fascinating read um, going back to the early 1800s when it became really a, a center for biblical Christianity in North America. And if you enjoy reading theological books or church history books, the names of men like Charles Hodge and Archibald Alexander and, and Samuel Miller who were at the beginning of Princeton Seminary are well known. Well, I want to tell you a story about Samuel Miller. He was actually the second professor hired to be a professor at Princeton Seminary. So this was in the very early years of the seminary. Archibald Alexander was the first professor. Samuel Miller would become the second. Well, Samuel Miller had been a very successful pastor in New York City. He actually pastored a church on Wall Street. And... It was sort of an unusual setup. It was, it was four churches that were tied together. And so it was sort of like a group of pastors that pastored each of these four churches. And Samuel Miller had the idea that they could do a better job of pastoring if they would divide up the congregations and divide up the pastors and just be committed to one church. 
Well, one of the other pastors accused Samuel Miller of doing this because he thought Samuel Miller wanted the Wall Street Church for himself. That Samuel Miller wanted to be the most famous, best recognized pastor in New York City. And that became a, a very difficult part of the history of Samuel Miller's uh, ministry in New York City. He did end up being the pastor of the Wall Street Church, but that wasn't his desire or aim. Well, when he got called to go to Princeton Seminary, he knew that he would be leaving that New York City context and going to a place where there already was another very successful pr professor, Archibald Alexander. And so just in preparing for that experience, he wrote out seven resolutions, things that before God he wanted to see accomplished in his life and ministry when he had the opportunity to become a professor at Princeton. Now I'm not going to read you all seven, but I want to read you two of the resolutions that he wrote out. He said, I will endeavor by the grace of God so to conduct myself toward my colleague in the seminary as never to give the least reasonable ground of offense. It shall be my aim by divine help ever to treat him with the most scrupulous respect and delicacy and never to wound his feelings if I know how to avoid it. That was the third resolution. Here's the fourth. And whereas during my residence in New York, a very painful part of my trouble arose from disagreement and collision with a colleague, I desire to set a double guard on myself in regard to this point. Resolve, therefore, that by the grace of God, while I will carefully avoid giving offense to my colleague, I will in no case take offense at his treatment of me. I have come hither resolving that whatever may be the sacrifice of my personal feelings, whatever may be the consequence, I will not take offense unless I am called upon to relinquish truth or duty. I not only will never, the Lord helping me, indulge a jealous, envious, or suspicious temper toward him, but I will in no case allow myself to be wounded by any slight or appearance of disrespect. I will give up all my own claims rather than let the cause of Christ suffer by animosity or contest. What am I that I should prefer my own honor or exaltation to the cause of my blessed master? Well, you see, there's a man who knew about the realism of the New Testament church. And he had nothing against Archibald Alexander when he went there. Didn't know that there would be any problems. As far as I've read in the history, I don't think there were any problems. But here was a man who, knowing that realism, said, I'm going to get these articles of clothing on me before I go into that situation. I'm going to be ready in case anything does arise. And so you can hear his determination to be humble and not to give offense and not to take offense and to seek the grace of God to be a godly man in that situation. So as we think about putting on these clothes of the new humanity, we need to work ahead of time. We need to take advantage of times of peace and unity and love and putting these things on so that we'll be ready when the difficulties come. A very clear means for putting on this clothing is prayer. Simply looking at this list, as we've looked at the other lists already here in chapter 3, and going through them one by one, and seeking the grace of God to be clothed with these things. You know, as we go along, it's the Spirit of God, as David knew in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. We come and say, well, Lord, I think I'm humble, but Lord, you know if I'm really humble. So your Spirit needs to show me what I need and help me to put on this article of clothing. 
prayer is a necessary tool as we would take all of these pieces of the clothing of the new humanity and put them on in our individual experience. Another tool that we need to use to put on this clothing is simply looking to the Lord Jesus. Looking to the Lord Jesus. As you see these articles of clothing uh, given here by Paul, we need to recognize that each one of them was worn by our Lord Jesus Christ during the days of His earthly ministry. We can go down through them just quickly and think about them. A compassionate heart. Well, that was seen in by the Lord Jesus so many times. Matthew tells us when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So the Lord Jesus could look out at the multitudes and see their troubled hearts and his heart went out to them. He felt sympathy for them in their time of great need. And of course it didn't stay there as an emotional response because the Lord Jesus went on to exercise kindness. He went about doing good. His sympathies weren't simply an emotional response to what he saw around him. His heart of compassion moved him to do many good things. Even when he was hanging on the cross in what what looked like utter helplessness, he was doing good. Praying for his persecutors, seeking to help a thief find salvation, thinking about the needs of his mother and who would care for him once he was gone. And of course, humility. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest example of lowliness of mind that the world will ever know. His descent from heaven to earth. His willingness to become a creature when He was the Creator. His submission to His Father to take up sorrow and suffering going to the cross in order to save us. Meekness. Talk about strength under control. In the Garden of Eden, Jesus could have called upon the legions of heaven to rescue Him. And yet He was willing to submit Himself and give Himself into the hands of His enemies. Patience. Think of how slow to anger the Lord Jesus was. How He was quiet in His heart even when they were speaking against Him in His trials. How he was bearing with people. He had to bear with the sins and stupidity of his own disciples. He would say to them several times, How long do I have to bear with you? How long do I have to endure you? Think of how he bears with us. In that hymn we were singing before the sermon. Could we bear from one another what he daily bears from us? Yet this glorious friend and brother loves us, though we treat him thus. Though for good we render ill, he accounts us brethren still. And forgiving. Where do we start with the examples? How many people did he forgive? From dealing with immoral women who came weeping to him to responding to his executioners the Lord Jesus had a heart marked by forgiveness and so as we would think about putting on these clothes of the new humanity we need to be thinking about the Lord Jesus meditating Uh, on Him wearing all of these clothes of grace. And as we fix our minds upon the Lord Jesus, that will become a means of transformation in our own lives. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, that when we focus on Christ, the Spirit of God will use that to transform us to be like Him. Paul summarized it in Romans 13 by saying, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we could say, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, patience, forbearance, be ready to forgive one another. Or we could just summarize it and say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And of course, we also need to remember as we reflect on these things and pray over these things, that many of these things are listed as the fruit of the Spirit. They're the result of the Spirit of God working in our lives. And so it's very appropriate to pray and ask the Spirit of God, make me meek, grant me the patience that I need. Here's a second question for us to consider as we think about putting on these clothes of the new humanity. What should you do when you have relationship problems in the church? So let's bring it to the point of contact. The point where we need these articles of clothing desperately. What should you do when you have relationship problems in the church? Let's say it's a relationship problem with a pastor or a fellow church member or somebody who's a regular visitor in the church. When sin erupts, when offense is given, when your heart is weighed down and groaning within you, what should you do? Do you respond in answer, in in anger? Do you avoid that person? Do you stay home from church? Do you try to become an expert in the issue uh, under discussion? What do you do? If we would all commit ourselves that when any problem ever erupts in the church, when anything ruffles our feathers or offense is given or, or something that causes us to go home from church grieved in our heart because of, uh, because of a relationship problem, if we would sit down first with Colossians 3, 12 and 13 and pray over that and say, Lord, how should I respond? Many of the problems would be taken care of right there. We need to come to this text of Scripture. We need to pray over it. We need to ask God to help us put on these articles of clothing and determine how we are going to respond by the grace of God. Question, how would the Gospel teach me to respond to this person? And here Paul gives us a most powerful word in verse 13. As he urges us to forgive each other, he says, As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. We've got to reflect on our own Christian experience and how our God has been willing to forgive us. And to go back over years of sin and rebellion, and transgressing of His law, and still even as believers, how every day we sin against our God, and yet He is willing to forgive us. And Paul says, the Gospel teaches you, as God has forgiven you, you must forgive your brother as well. In this life, We're always going to be confronted as we study the Scripture with these ideals and realities. We can't escape them. There's no perfect church in this world. You'll never find it. I remember somebody saying, if you're searching for a perfect church and you find it, as soon as you go, you'll wreck it. Well, that's reality. It's always going to be there. We're going to be confronted with these things. Only in eternity will the realities of our sinfulness disappear and the ideals will become the complete reality. And until then, we need to be clothing ourselves as the new humanity. Those who are the elect, the holy, the beloved of God. And may God help us that here in the church, as we deal with these realities, we might grow and develop as God's new humanity and be a people who will bring glory and honor to His name. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, how we need Your help. 
We know these things to be true. We've experienced them in our own lives, our, our, our church life. And yet our God, we want to be people who bring you glory. We want to be people who show to one another and to the world that you are doing a great and glorious work in our hearts. Father, please come and help us. Do that work in our lives that only you can do. We pray, Spirit of God, that you would search our hearts and help us to know ourselves truly. We pray that you would rebuke us where we need it and lead us to the cross, lead us to the Lord Jesus who is so willing to forgive. Help us in putting on these clothes of the new humanity. Heavenly Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.